Good evening, I'm Ian Hanamancy. Tonight, growing calls for accountability on residential schools from inside and outside Canada. We're asking to do the right thing. Plus, new developments in Kamloops. Restaurants are finding it hard to hire staff. There is a lot at stake. If you like someone, we need to hire them right away. A pandemic talking point for parents, kids doing school at home. Burnout is very real. Um, I think my students have experienced it. And Canadian rap artists take the stage. Try to expand what the possibilities look like for rappers in this country. Are they finally getting their due? This is The National. Many people across this country are on a search for truth and healing after a B.C. First Nation announced 215 children are believed to be buried at a former residential school in Kamloops. Tonight, demands for accountability are getting louder. Justin Trudeau is calling on all Roman Catholics to pressure the church to apologize for its role in residential schools, while others want his government to start a cross-country search for more unmarked burial sites. At the center of this story is a grieving community. Today, the federal government restricted the airspace over the former Kamloops Residential School for the privacy of survivors and their families. But the chief revealed what the next steps there could be. Susanna De Silva explains. Hundreds of kilometers from Kamloops, a show of how the news is reverberating across Canada. I wanted to show people that these were children. And I wanted to show them what 215 kids looks like so that they could understand that it was our children that were buried in those graves. It's not just a number. On the Tecumloops Teshkwepmik First Nation, emotions are still raw. We're all grieving. This is unprecedented. And we need to do the right thing. And there is no roadmap. The First Nation says it expects to release a report about what was found at the end of June. In the meantime, it's taking the lead while working with the RCMP and the coroner's service. But other work is already underway. Archivists are scouring the records of the school. Those sometimes are in, um, in ledgers or journals. They might be correspondence. Um, or, or other documentations. There are boxes of documents shared in 2019 by the missionary Oblates of Mary Immaculate, the Catholic order that ran the school. The hope is to digitize the records and share them with the First Nation. So far, no list of deaths has been found. The records are dispersed in a number of places across the country, so we are working closely with other organizations. In 1991, the order apologized for its role. I can only imagine how much more powerful the, the apology would be coming from His Holiness, Pope Francis. A public apology, not just for us, but for the world who also shared in those suffrages. The chief is also asking that this Sunday be a national day of prayer. Susanna De Silva, CBC News, Vancouver. The Prime Minister was asked today whether he thinks it's still appropriate to have buildings named after architects of the residential school system, like Sir John A. Macdonald and Egerton Ryerson. We always need to um, retain um, awareness of the past, but awareness that is nuanced and informed uh, and understanding. Justin Trudeau says he can't dictate whether it's appropriate for a place to carry a certain name. He says that decision has to be taken through careful reflection and open conversations. The Prime Minister also had a message for the Catholic Church today. It's time to say sorry and to hand over residential school records. But as Olivia Stefanovic explains, many say his government needs to act too. Chief David Moniaz of Pamichigamak Cree Nation is following the threads of his community's residential school stories. This lady said that uh, this girl was in, uh, they came to get the girl in the middle of the night. They, they took her away, they never seen her again. He's traveled more than 500 kilometers south in search of ground penetrating radar to find answers and to hold the federal government accountable. We're asking to do the right thing asking you to investigate and uh, allow all this investigation to be done by international bodies. Pressure is growing on Ottawa to investigate the deaths and disappearances of Indigenous children from residential schools. 
An independent investigation is required. The national chief of the Assembly of First Nations wants an inquiry into all former residential school sites to determine how many more burials there may be. It is unacceptable if this situation remains in impunity on, or without full investigation. United Nations human rights experts are in touch with Canada and with the Holy See. The Vatican is also responsible. The Catholic Church ran more than half of the schools, but it's the only institution not to have made a formal apology. As a Catholic, I am deeply disappointed. The Prime Minister says the Pope needs to say sorry, and the Church must release all residential school records. If it refuses, Justin Trudeau says the government is prepared to take measures to compel it to. It's going to be a really important moment for all of us, particularly Catholics across the country. Uh, to reach out uh, in our local parishes, to reach out to bishops and cardinals, uh, and uh, make it clear that we expect the church uh, to take up and uh, step up. So, Olivia, what could happen next? Well, Ian, the government has legal tools available to it. For now, it's working with religious leaders, but some First Nation leaders wanted to use all relevant international institutions and laws. Meanwhile, for the people across Canada paying tribute at memorials like this one, the focus is on honoring the people at the heart of the story. Ian? Thanks, Olivia. Let's turn to Canada's COVID-19 story now. Nearly 60% of all Canadians have had at least one dose of vaccine, and the supply is expected to keep growing. Today, the Prime Minister said that Canada is buying more. Option for 3 million more Pfizer doses to be delivered in September. We'll keep getting shipments secured until everyone can get their shots. Over the past three months, the number of doses administered has gone from about a million to more than 25 million. 29 million have been delivered, most of it Pfizer, with more than 2 million Pfizer doses expected each week. Canada will have received more than 48 million doses by August 1st, and now 3 million more coming in September. That will be enough to give at least 75% of the eligible population two doses. And Ontario has moved to widen access to those second doses. Starting now at some pharmacies with a wider rollout Monday, anyone who received their first shot on or before April 18th, regardless of age, can book their second. Anticipating demand for travel from people across the country, the Atlantic provinces have plans to open their borders to Canadians as long as those visiting have proof they're vaccinated. But as Kayla Housel explains, that amounts to a kind of vaccine passport, and that remains controversial. Here's the pitch. We are excited to lift the travel ban and welcome recreational travelers to Newfoundland and Labrador. But there's a catch. If you want to sail right into Newfoundland and Labrador, you must be fully vaccinated. If you're partially vaccinated, you'd better have a negative COVID-19 test. Unvaccinated Canadians will still have to self-isolate for 14 days. While much of the world debates the use of the so-called vaccine passport, the Atlantic provinces are just doing it. I'm not prepared to open a border until we have a system in place that shows that they have proof of uh, vaccine. Exactly what that system will be hasn't been hashed out yet. Newfoundland and Labrador says it will use existing digital travel declaration forms. We are working through uh, processes now that will allow people to upload their uh, proof of vaccination uh, to the travel form. And uh, so hopefully that, um, you know, at the border, uh, that, uh, that confirmation won't need to happen there. It'll have already happened. Newfoundland and New Brunswick are planning to kick off vaccination verification first on Canada Day. And this bioethicist says that timing is a problem. I will not be vaccinated or double vaxxed, I should say, by July 1st. And look at me, I've got grey hair. Before, there were rules between some of the provinces, but they applied uniformly to everybody. Now, you've got different categories of people, and people are in those categories not necessarily by choice. Bayless says the provinces need to consider people who can't be vaccinated for medical reasons and what they'll do if they discover vaccine fraud. 
you know, um, you're just going to turn them back at the border? Well, maybe. Maybe they're already in your, in your province. You're going to go looking for them and arrest them? What are you thinking you're going to do? She's urging all provinces, not just the Atlantic region, to come up with a uniform plan to help make things a little more fair for all Canadians. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, Halifax. Prosecutors in New Brunswick today dropped a charge against a doctor for allegedly failing to follow quarantine rules. He was investigated by police, subjected to racist slurs, and says he was called out by the premier. Today he's free of the charge, but as he told Judy Trin, not of personal pain. Today in a New Brunswick court, the Crown withdrew the charge, but Dr. Jean-Robert Angola says the damage has been done. And suddenly, without any investigations, you treat a human being like a criminal. Angola has since moved to Quebec to practice medicine, but says he feels under constant scrutiny. You lose the confidence of your patients. At the time of the outbreak, dozens of New Brunswick hospital workers lived in Quebec and crossed the border to work. But Angola says after the premier singled him out, he was subjected to racist attacks on social media, including calls to burn down his home and lynch him. In a letter, his lawyers demanded Premier Blaine Higgs unequivocally apologize for calling Angola an irresponsible health care worker. A diversity consultant hired by Angola's lawyer says the Premier should do more than apologize, that he should investigate who leaked the doctor's name and find out why a police investigation of Angola involved 21 officers. Understanding the work that needs to be done to repair the relationship and going deep in the chain of command to understand how an entire system failed Dr. Ngola. That to me will be the true test. After getting his COVID-19 vaccine today, Higgs says he won't apologize. If I recall at the time, it was, uh, it was when we had our first fatality in the, in the long journey of COVID. And, uh, and we needed to uh, ensure that everyone was following the rules carefully and, and taking every case and every situation seriously. So it was... Uh, it's unfortunate if he took it personally, but it, uh, I, I, don't, I didn't direct it. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't name him. Angola's legal team says they will now seek accountability through a civil suit. Judy Trin, CBC News, Ottawa. As more kids around the world get the Pfizer vaccine, a small number have had inflammation of the heart. It has researchers and officials watching closely, but as Christine Burak explains, they say they have found no cause for alarm. There are no clear cases in Canada, but some parents are asking pediatricians, should they be concerned about reports of teens with heart inflammation days after being vaccinated? I think for now, it, it doesn't really change much. For serious Health officials problems, agree. They are relatively mild illnesses. Some have been hospitalized, but uh, with a short stay. A new American study outlined seven cases of myo or pericarditis in boys aged 14 to 19. Each went to hospital with chest pains after their second shot of Pfizer vaccine, where scans detected heart muscle inflammation. The study is preliminary, but notes none of the boys was critically ill and they all went home. And there's no definite causal relationship between these cases and the vaccine. We currently do not see any higher rates than would be expected in the general population, but it is somewhere, something that we uh, need to continuously monitor. An unpublished Israeli study does suggest there is a probable link between the second Pfizer dose and myocarditis in young men, but Israeli health officials still gave the go-ahead this week to start vaccinating 12 to 15-year-olds, stating the efficacy of the vaccine outweighs the risk. Israel definitely have, you know, sort of delivered the second dose very quickly, you know, in their population, and I think that's why they were able to see some of this. Cardiologist Dr. Peter Liu says younger people tend to have very active immune systems. He says in rare cases, their response to the second dose may be too strong. In the older folks, you know, sometimes it may not generate enough antibody, but in the younger folks, sometimes you get, get over-exuberant uh, response. Dr. Liu says myocarditis can also be caused by other common viruses like the cold. Young people interacting again could explain an uptick in cases. So far, health officials say cases are few and they're mild, but each one is being tracked. Christine Birak, CBC News, Toronto. With each wave of the pandemic, Canada's economy has had its own surges and crashes. 
In May, 68,000 people lost their jobs. That nudged the unemployment rate up to 8.2 percent. Stats Canada says if that were to include people who want to work but have given up looking, it would be well past 10 percent. As more provinces begin to open up, though, more jobs are expected to return. And as Jacqueline Hansen tells us, some industries are worried that much of their workforce just isn't coming back. For this downtown Toronto wine bar, a job fair is a first. Servers, dishwashers, sous chefs, you name it, they need it. If you like someone, we need to hire them right away. With reopening patios on the horizon, competition for experienced staff is heating up. Dining in this city and others has been restricted for so much of the past year that many in the industry are worried some workers have moved on and simply won't come back. Probably about 60% of them are not coming back due to the fact that either found something different uh, to make a living or have moved out of the city. Restaurants Canada says there was already a labor shortage pre-pandemic and it keeps the owner of this barbecue joint up at night. One of the reasons I'm so terrified is because I just I just don't know if it's going to be better or worse. His restaurant's survival hinges on more staff and more sales. If we don't have our restaurant running at at least 30% more revenue um, by the beginning of August will be bankrupt by the fall. In the U.S., many restaurants reported reopening shorthanded. Some there blame government aid for keeping people out of the workforce. For many businesses, they, they, they have to raise wages. They have to uh, have proper incentives to get people uh, back to work. Though not all businesses have the money to pay more. If you don't have the margin to absorb it, probably you have to raise your, your prices in order to, to, to pay for, for, for the, 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 the higher cost. The recent scramble for staff in Canada is a relief for this student. I'm really eager to get back to work. And despite the staffing challenges for an already hard hit industry, there is optimism there too. I can only hope that people are coming back to the city so people will look at the hospitality industry as again a full-time job. Even if full capacity could still be months away. Jacqueline Hansen, CBC News, Toronto. Ontario police are reviewing the alleged assault of a federal inmate by guards in a maximum security prison. It happened in 2012, but only now has video of the incident been made public as the man and his lawyer push for criminal charges. Magda Gebersalasa begins with the video. There's no sound, but inmate Christoph Lewis hopes the video speaks volumes. He's the one in white. It was in 2012 and he was re-entering Millhaven Institute, a maximum security facility in Ontario. He says the female officer demanded to strip search him. He says he asked for a male officer to do it, which is protocol. Then several correctional officers approach. Lewis recounts what he says the officers did then. Pepper spraying me, viciously punching me, kicking and choking me. The attack on me was unprovoked and vicious. Lewis said he filed and won a grievance, but says the officers remained on the job. Today, he and his lawyer released the video. What is important is that people see that and realize that this happens sometimes in institutions and uh, it should not happen. In a statement, Correctional Service Canada wrote, we recognize this video is concerning and corrective action was taken but citing privacy reasons didn't specify those measures. This advocate hopes going public will help improve the rights of inmates. Prison advocates and, and presently and formerly incarcerated people across Canada talk about the fact um, that there is a culture of violence and impunity uh, in, in prisons um, and that guards are in a position where they can do almost whatever they want. He's now at a facility in Quebec. But enough is enough. I'd rather be remembered as a man standing up for himself and what's right than a coward cowering down to an oppressive system. Lewis and his supporters are calling for an investigation and criminal charges. The Ontario Provincial Police says it's in the early stages of reviewing the material. Mark de Gebrasalas, CBC News, Toronto. The revelations out of Kamloops have spurred painful questions across the country. I get so emotional. Just thinking of kids that you know taken away and they're probably so lost. Up next, the search for answers reawakened in this northern community. Plus.
they get the grants, they get the awards, and yeah. it doesn't necessarily speak to the, the homegrown talent. Will Canadian rap finally get the respect at home it already has around the world? And... From Indonesia to Newfoundland, for the love of country music and one of its great icons, we're back in two. People in Hong Kong defied a police ban for the second year in a row to mark the anniversary of China's Tiananmen Square massacre in 1989. Authorities blocked off a park to prevent people from gathering and arrested an organizer. Last year, Beijing imposed new national security laws to tighten its control over Hong Kong. We're applying the, the, the most severe penalty that we have in the range of penalties now available to us under the new enforcement arrangements that we published today. Donald Trump's Facebook ban has been extended for two years. The former U.S. president was suspended for posts inciting the January 6th riots at the U.S. Capitol. Trump has criticized the decision, calling it censorship and an insult to his voters. Back to more on our top story now. Across this country, there is a strong belief there are many unmarked graves of children at residential school sites. And the recent discovery in Kamloops has renewed calls to search for them. Juanita Taylor shows us that in the Northwest Territories, stories of children who vanished have endured for decades. Wilfred Simon thinks a lot about the children who never made it home from residential school. I get so emotional. I was thinking of kids that uh, stuck there from their parents and, you know, taken away and they're probably so lost and probably so hurt and then they die, <laughs> you know, in, in the arms of, they probably don't even know who. Yeah. All in this area. Simon went to residential school. He fears there are unmarked graves here in the cemetery and in town. This community was once the site of St. Joseph's Residential School. Thirteen years ago, he called for an investigation to find out how many children died and who they were. But nothing was done. They, they think that we're going against a Catholic church. or uh, we're, going, we're not going against, against any church. This is the site where St. Joseph's Residential School once stood. Children from across the Northwest Territories and beyond were taken from their families and sent here. But fires, shortages of food and illnesses closed its doors in 1957. That's when the children were moved to another residential school in Fort Smith. Today, that legacy is on the minds of many people in Fort Resolution. And he talked about children being buried in the yard here, too. Lainey Bolio's great-grandfather went to St. Joseph's Residential School. She would like to see that site searched. Yeah. I would love if we could use those um, machines here to do the same thing they did in Kamloops. I feel like it would be kind of a good sense of closure. The chief of the Deninukwe First Nation agrees. I'm not sure if that really happened here, you know. It'll be something that could be investigated and we should push for it and uh, hopefully the community can heal from that, you know, to get, the, get it out, you know, say, this really happened in our community, you know, instead of hearsay. The territorial government says it is willing to work with Indigenous leaders to get to the truth. The more we talk, the more we heal. And the more we heal, the better people we become. And I believe we're, we're going to get there one day. The Native people are very strong. And that strength is what keeps Wilfred Simon patiently waiting for answers. Juanita Taylor, CBC News, Fort Resolution, Northwest Territories. It is a painful history and those who lived it have a message for the rest of Canada. I want the non-Indigenous people to know that uh, how painful it was and how the colonization hurt us so badly. Coming up, three survivors, their experiences in their own words. Plus, students in Ontario got the news this week they won't be heading back until the fall. Up next, I'll speak to a teacher and parent about what that means to them. And online, I'm just sitting there doing, just clicking the computer. 
not getting enough physical activity. Where do you normally work? Here, on my floor in my egg chair. I'm a JK and I didn't get single kids in kindergarten. What some Ontario parents and kids were worried about indeed became official this week. Students will not be heading back to the classroom this month. Some 2 million students in the province have now been learning from home or trying to learn from home for more than four months. Compare that to neighbouring Quebec, which had just eight weeks of closures for some. And here in British Columbia, only a few dozen schools closed at all, and even then, it was just for a couple of weeks. Ontario has been in this position of, of closed schools, the longest in Canada. And whether they agree with it or not, parents, teachers and students alike are feeling the weight of it. So joining us now are two people caught in the middle. Jay Williams is a middle school teacher in Toronto. And Lindsay Soberano-Wilson is a high school teacher and a parent. And she joins us from Vaughan, just north of Toronto. Welcome to both of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Jay, how did, how did you and your class react to the news that you will not be returning to the classroom until the end of the school year? Well, I mean, Ian, to be honest with you, it was a, a response that we knew was coming. I would say about 75% of my students were realistically happy, happy that we weren't going back. I know there's a lot of talk about mental health and the protection of mental health of students, but what my students particularly said is that going back to school would be more damaging than anything else realistically. Yeah, and just to be clear, so, so yeah, nobody's going back to school until the beginning of the next school year. Lindsay, as a teacher, as a parent, what was your reaction? Yeah, I mean, I think there was some disappointment around here because I teach grade nine. They were kind of excited about the potential to return and definitely disappointed. I mean, from their point of view, you know, they could have made a few more friendships um, before summer. And then my own children were definitely disappointed because I have uh, three young boys, JK, grade one and grade five, who are very social and active and it's been very hard for them and they were excited about going back. So they were disappointed, yes. There are a lot of people who are watching who have not been in this position of having kids at home trying to learn online during the pandemic. So we, we asked some parents to show us what it's like, like just, just kind of, you know, put the camera around their living rooms or wherever else and also to hear what it's like. I want to play you a piece of tape now. This is what my little girl looks like. So this is our setup for online learning. It's me sitting here, my youngest sitting here, so I can help her with grade one. We had good intentions of my older two taking up spots here too, but we quickly learned that that was too loud with three teams meetings plus any calls I had going on. My kids are in grade five, grade two, and kindergarten. So there is a lot of overlap between the teachers talking and their classmates answering questions. No the noises can really get to me and it can get very annoying. It is extremely difficult to work from home and also help your child who is doing distance learning. It is very labor intensive for the parents. It is not as engaging for the children as being in class and many of us are finding that our children are struggling. What are you looking at on your phone? No. TikTok. But isn't class going on? No. So, Lindsay, you can't see the video from where you are in Vaughan, but you're living it because you have... I mean, it makes me stressful even to see those parents. They're trying to work on the computer. Their kids are doing something on the computer. What's it been like for you? Yes, no, I mean, it's been very hectic. I'd say for the most part, our setup would be me in the kitchen and my son and JK also in the kitchen. Then we'd have my son in grade one in the family room and, of course, my grade five son upstairs in his own room. Um, but, yes, it's been very challenging because, you know what, not only do they have to engage with their own class, but they have to not distract each other in their other classes, right? Um, and then, of course, me trying to oversee my own class. I think I do have to admit that, you know, the best thing that came out of it all was realizing um, how understanding my own students were. Um, and I think, you know, the more fair I have been with them, the more fair they've been with me, right? And so I think that was one kind of interesting thing that came out of it all, of 
how understanding my own students have been. I love how people uh, find silver linings uh, in the clouds mm -hmm. of this pandemic. Uh, Jay, I hear a lot about burnout for, for students, for sure, doing all of this online learning at home, and for teachers as well. What's your view on that? Burnout is very real. Um, I think my students have experienced it in a way that I understand, because we as teachers are also experiencing burnout. Um, as, as, as we know, engagement is down across the board. Um, cameras are off. You know, students using microphones is, is happening even, even less than it was in the beginning. And students just express a, a way of wanting to find a means to have fun again, not be on their laptop for six hours a day. So, and, I, and I get that. That's realistic. And uh, how, 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 Jay, how do you manage to keep kids engaged or what do you do to try to keep them engaged? Well, realistically, at this point, too, now, I've dropped all things that I, I think I've had in plans for my regular, quote-unquote, year, and we're only focusing on what's relevant, what's in the media, what's hot, if you will, what really interests them. So giving students that autonomy, again, to feel as though what we're doing is of relevance and of interest to them. Um, that realistically is the only way I'm going to get them to be there consistently day in and day out and to complete assignments at this point. Lindsay, you can answer this question as a teacher or as a parent or maybe as both. I hear a lot of people talking about this potentially being a lost year for kids in school this year. Uh, what, what, what's your view of that? Yeah, I believe it really depends on the individual. I believe that maybe some students have definitely fallen behind, unfortunately. And I think there are many who have just hung on. But what we do know for sure is that there are none that are thriving and have excelled. So we really do have to look for, you know, um, filling in those gaps of learning and getting more support when we do return to the classroom. And Jay, we have uh, about 30 seconds. I, I know you don't feel that this is a, a lost year necessarily, but, but I guess the gaps we always see in school maybe got a little wider this year. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Gaps definitely were widened, and, and we know exactly who we're talking about when we're talking about those gaps. We're talking about our black and brown children across the board. We're talking about our boys when it comes to math and to reading comprehension. So um, Lindsay nailed it on the head. What are we going to do as a staff, as teachers, as boards, when we get back to the classroom, to the school, to ensure that the right resources are in place to rectify those problems? Well, it was only a short conversation, but I got to say, I don't uh, detect any burnout from either one of you. You seem like engaged educators, and then let's hope for a better school year in the fall. Thanks for speaking with us. Thank you so Thank much. You. Canada's residential schools are part of a painful history, but for survivors, that pain was a daily reality. I experienced emotional, physical, mental, and sexual abuse. Coming up, three survivors, their stories, and their message for Canada. Welcome back. Many Canadians are trying to better understand the grim truth of residential schools. Since news broke last week about a large burial site discovered at a former school in Kamloops. But for former residents, the violent abuse and awful neglect aren't news at all. Tonight, three of them tell us their stories. The details are disturbing, but they explain why they want you to hear them. My name is Clifford Kwa. I am from the Tlaitli Tene First Nations. I'm also an elder and a residential school survivor. And I attended the Lejac Indian Residential School located 200 kilometers west of Prince George. My name is Cora Voyager. I'm a survivor of the Holy Angels Residential School in Fort Chipoyan, Alberta. My name is uh, Rose Grace Miller. I am survivor of the Kamloops Indian Residential School in Kamloops. I was five years old when it, I was forcibly taken I was nine years old when I was uh, taken. I was only eight years old at the time. We were loaded onto a cattle truck in 1949 and brought to the uh, residential school, my two brothers and myself. I was uh, in residential school with my two younger sisters, Lillian and Dorothy. At this school, I experienced emotional, physical, mental, and sexual abuse. 
and the trauma was so great that I blanked most of my school days at, at Lejac. The violence that we experienced at the hands of the nuns was quite random. So it was like you were walking on eggshells and didn't really know, um, you know, what was going to happen next. And it was uh, horrible to be there. They told us if we didn't pray, the devil would uh, take us to hell and burn us. They said if we didn't pray, the Romans would come and they would drape us and they would burn our eyes and burn our hands and poke out our eyes. Eight years old, you believe whatever you're told. So we pray all the harder. When I was uh, in residential school, there was one instance that uh, I experienced where my sister was being beaten by a nun. Uh, on the other side of a door and my sister was screaming and crying and I was on the other side of the door trying to get in and trying to to basically rescue her from uh, a nun who seemed to be quite out of control. It was terrifying to have someone that you love being uh, being beaten and really not being able to do anything about it. Many times we got knocked to the floor by the nuns and uh, they would call us a whore. We don't even know what a whore is. I was raped there at Indian school. For me, I, it had followed me through my life. The anger, the fear, the shame. I was so mad and angry and everything. All my life was big negative, negativity. All my posit positive attitudes I buried. My reaction to the news out of Kamloops from last week was, of course, great sadness and sympathy for the families of those, uh, of those children who never did come back from residential school. But I wasn't surprised by it. I don't for a minute believe that this is the only one uh, in Canada. I, as a survivor, expected this. But what really shocked me was uh, I thought it'd be 10 or 20, but when they said 215, you'd expect to find that somewhere else but in Canada. That was mind-boggling. We knew that there was missing children. We knew there was children that uh, were buried on the hillside there and probably on the school. We knew there was uh, people burned in an incinerator just below our rec room. It could have very easily have been me or one of my sisters. It could have been my brothers, it could have been me. Couldn't have ran away. I could have drowned in a river. I was only eight years old. I want non-Indigenous people to know that there is a very dark history in Canada and that People have to be understanding and they have to be compassionate. I want the non-Indigenous people to know that uh, how painful it was and how the colonization hurt us so badly, how it's still hurting us with the racism. I want the non-Indigenous people to understand. They must know, they must learn more about the schools. And that's the reason, one of the reasons why I'm doing this to educate the public about what happened in the residential schools and how I went through about 20 years of my life to where I am today. They need to understand and stand beside us. It's not their fault. I'm not bringing this up to blame anybody, but I want the history to be known. This is a traumatizing time for many people who went to residential schools and many others. And there is support available through the National Indian Residential School Crisis Line. You can get access to emotional and crisis referral services by calling the 24-hour number on your screen. Next on the National, celebrating 30 years of Canadian rap at the Junos. Started from the bottom, now we're here. Started we'll take you through the highlights and lows that's right after this.
I'm Jamie Poisson. Join me for CBC's daily news podcast, Front Burner. Every weekday, Front Burner takes you deep into the story shaping Canada and the world. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. The pain made me everything I am. Rapper Toby kicked off Juno's weekend with performances at the opening night awards. The ceremony, which is celebrating his 50th anniversary, has a big lineup for the main show. That's on Sunday, including Jesse Reyes, Justin Bieber, and the Tragically Hip, who will perform alongside Feist. This year's ceremony also marks the 30th anniversary of the Juno's Rap Recording of the Year category. The show plans to honour that with a special performance by the award's inaugural winner, Maestro Fresh West. As Eli Glasner shows us, it's a significant tribute from a show that hasn't always celebrated the genre. Symphony in effect, <laughs> Maestro Fresh West. It was Canadian music history. Before Scarborough's maestro got backbone sliding, there wasn't even a rap recording category. 30 years later, maestro still remembers the feeling. I was a little nervous saying my speech because I knew it was bigger than me. It wasn't just about me, it's about my brothers and sisters. I definitely gotta thank the Juno staff and everybody else, KRS, for uh, recognizing not only rap music, but black music in Canada. Fast forward to the late 1990s, Canadian rap was a growing force but you wouldn't know it from watching the Junos as the rap category was left out of the broadcast. I'm complex from my station. After the Rascals refused to accept their award in 98, next year rap was in the show and the Rascals returned. This is a minor achievement for hip hop and urban music here at the Junos. Started from the bottom, now we're here. With the rise of Drake, no one's overlooking Canadian hip hop today. While the Junos famously missed their mark to award him when he hosted, he's doing all right. The artist of the decade to the leader of our family, Drake. As the Canadian sound of hip hop evolves, some say the industry is still playing catch up. Take Pressa, a rapper with millions of views, but no Juno's love. There's a feeling sometimes you look at Can with Canadian music and it's like this insular thing where it's like not clear who their fans are, but they get the grants, they get the awards, and yeah. it doesn't necessarily speak to the, the homegrown talent. Watch them bring it. Rapper Havaya Maiti says the smaller population makes it harder, but change is happening. Canadian rap artists like myself are also continuing to try to expand what the possibilities look like for rappers in this country. So just glide, glide. Let your backbone slide. Building on what Let Your Backbone Slide started. Eli Glasner, CBC News, Toronto. When we return, how the music of Juno Hall of Fame member Shania Twain reached across an ocean and inspired a man from Indonesia to relocate to Newfoundland. We'll explain next. When Zayn Nova first heard Shania Twain's music, he was awestruck. So many of us were, but he got a job at an Indonesian country radio station, started up a band, and later moved to Canada. Zay's story and his love of Shania is our moment. I was born in a small village called Samban in Bangka Island, Indonesia. Then when I was in senior high school, my friend introduced me Shania Twain. And I start to uh, to read the lyric, uh, even though not really, you know, it's a, uh, English is my it, it is my third language, and that's how I start to fall in love with this music. I didn't know that's country. I've been working in radio station for 14 years in Indonesia, and uh, one day I met my partner, so we start to explore opportunity in Canada. Take a couple of years to uh, to learn uh, country music, and I start a band. Right I found connection right away to Newfoundland. Music scene is part of people's life here. I said to my partner, "Let's stay here. I love this land." So here I am. That is the perfect 
moment for the kickoff to Juno weekend because how better to celebrate the reach of Canadian music? You know, I'm sure versions of that story uh, happened all around the world, especially Shania Twain's powerhouse albums from the 90s. So many people have listened to them. Not everybody, though, decided to move from Indonesia to Newfoundland. That is The National for June 4th. I hope you can join me Sunday for Cross Country Checkup on CBC Radio at 4 p.m. Eastern, 1 Pacific, and then later that evening back here on The National. Good night.